Lords 2015. It was once again an exciting summer at the most iconic cricket ground in the world. The Ashes was undoubtedly the headline event as the old enemy Australia was back in town, but there was much more to be celebrated this summer. It was a truly wonderful year, thanks in no small part to the cricketers, of course, the cricketers of New Zealand, Australia and England, uh, and many other cricketers too, who performed out on the hallowed turf and on the nursery ground. Following England's victory in Cardiff over Australia, the sides met at Lords for the second Investec test. It was to be a rare moment of Australian dominance during the summer. The day before the match, Australian captain Michael Clark took time to visit St Edward's Catholic Primary School in Westminster. The school kids, coached as part of MCC's community programme, got a chance to play cricket with Clark and meet MCC's Ashes mascot, Ernie, the Ashes Urn. It was back to business for Clark the next day. Australia dominated from the start, with Steve Smith and Chris Rogers both getting their names on the famous honours board. Rogers on 99, and a shrill shriek of delight from Chris Rogers. Finally, he gets 100. He gets on the honours board at Lords. It's a special moment. To bat all day, um, day one of a, a Lords Test. You know that that's as an opening batsman, that's as good as it gets. You know, I think as players, you you always want to get your name up on the honour board. And if and if you're going to think about any place in the world apart from maybe in Australia, you want to, to have your name up there, it's, it's Lords. And um, after the Cardiff test, we needed a couple of players to stand up and I wanted to be one of those guys. Australia won the match by a mammoth 405 runs after England crumbled on day four to just 103 all out. Test match. The margin, a monumental 405 runs, one of Australia's finest hours. Earlier in the summer, England beat New Zealand in a brilliant Test match at the home of cricket. The match went the full distance, and much credit must be given to MCC head groundsman Mick Hunt and his team for producing a fantastic pitch. There was, however, one very notable absentee from the match, as the Lord's weather vane, Father Time, was nowhere to be seen. He'd been blown over by a gust of wind in March and had to be treated for copper damage. It's the first time since being put up in 1926 that the weather vane had missed a test. Thankfully, he was soon repaired and back in place for the Ashes. Back on the pitch, a new hero was born during the match when Ben Stokes hit the fastest test hundred at Lord's. Hit that. Don't worry about that. There it is. Fantastic moment for Ben Stokes. A seam stealing, scintillating hundred. And what's more, it's the fastest Test hundred ever made at Lords in 85 balls. He has pulverised the New Zealand bowlers. Tourist Kane Williamson with an impressive 132, and Trent Bolt with five for 87 also reached personal milestones, both getting their names on the honours board. It's always a great experience to come to London, to the home of cricket, and um, enjoy all the build-up that, that comes with the Test match. So, uh, obviously the result didn't go quite our way, but um, yeah, a very, very amazing experience. It really wasn't, wasn't uh, my thinking to go out there and try to get them all, but it was very nice to, to get them, and, and obviously to tick up five was um, something I'm not going to forget in a long time but it was Stokes who stole the show, taking two wickets in two balls on the final day and claiming a well-deserved Man of the Match award. Oh, yes! As three balls go, they just did. And it's a big fish too, Kane Williamson. Oh, yeah! <laughs> this is off the chart. We talked about both of them yesterday. And now Ben Stokes mirrored him with the bat. Now he's doing it with the ball. That's Brendan McCullum, by the way. It was perhaps after this test that there was belief Alistair Cook and his team really could regain the Ashes. 
Despite their defeat to the Australians at Lords, England won back the urn convincingly by the time of the fourth test at Trent Bridge. Against the odds, Alistair Cook's team have completely outplayed Australia. Joy is absolutely merited. In the Royal London One Day International, Australia once again got the upper hand at the home of cricket, winning by 64 runs. But the match may well be best remembered for an incident in which England's Ben Stokes was given out for obstructing the ball. Oh dear, oh dear. well, he's immediately apologised, that was vicious. I think the Australians are asking whether that's obstructing the field because Stokes is in the way of the throw, which was aimed at the stumps. <laughs> I think it's just a, an instinctive reaction from Stokes. And he's been given out. Well, that's a surprise. Stokes can't believe it. Well, England don't like it, of course. Now, some would say that wasn't in the spirit of the game. Others argued that by the simple letter of the law, he was out. And that was the end of it. The Royal London One Day Cup final saw a fairy tale for former England wicketkeeper Geraint Jones. The 2005 Ashes hero was on the winning side as underdogs Gloucestershire rolled back the years to beat Surrey in a thrilling game. Jones, who marked the occasion with a 50, was carried off the pitch by teammates after a tense six-run victory. To go out in this way, uh, to be able to get a few runs and, and help contribute, and then, you know, I had a bit of a passenger role in the field, to be honest. I was able to, to watch it and, uh, yeah, watch it unfold and, and sort of watch from afar, so that was quite nice. I wasn't in the, in the mix like I have been for so many years with the gloves on, so... Uh, yeah, no, great way to go out and, uh, yeah, incredible. As ever, there was a host of fixtures played on the main ground at Lords throughout 2015, as amateur and professional cricketers shared special moments on the hallowed turf. Following the England-Australia Test match, MCC were given the chance to restore some English pride as they welcomed their sister club from Melbourne. The match was played on the test pitch and brought an England victory as MCC won by six wickets. Chad Barrett, a graduate of the club's young cricketers scheme, shone with the ball taking three for 30 before George Adair and their son Jayaratnam helped the host knock off 165 with 10 overs to spare. Back in April, Stuart Pointer, another former young cricketer, hit a fantastic century to guide Ireland A to victory against MCC. Ireland were teetering on the brink of collapse when the 25-year-old came in to make a brilliant 105 not out from just 82 balls. He was supported by teammate Greg Thompson, who hit 61 not out to help see them home. In an Interclub 2020 competition, MCC North and North East were crowned winners. The tournament saw MCC regions North West, West Midlands, South West and South East make it to Lords. North and North East beating West Midlands by 50 runs in the final. In June, the Army, Navy and RAF did battle in the annual Inter-Services T20 competition. The Army were the team to beat in the round-robin format, held on the main ground for the sixth year running. They comfortably overcame the Navy by seven wickets in the first match. Unable to redeem themselves in the next game, the Navy lost once again, this time against the RAF. It set up a winner-take-all final between the Army and the RAF. And it was the boys in red who lifted the trophy for the second year in a row as the Army chased a total of 120. <laughs> 201 years is a long time, and that's how long the current Lord's Ground has been in existence. So it was fitting that the oldest fixture, the schoolboy match between Eton and Harrow, and the traditional university clash of Oxford and Cambridge took place once again on the main ground. Eton emerged victorious against Harrow in a rain-affected game thanks to a one-man show from opening bat Armand Trion, 
whose 103 not out of 98 balls helped chase down a Duckworth Lewis revised total of 186 in 35.5 overs to claim a six-wicket victory. In the varsity match, Oxford gained bragging rights with a 43-run victory as Cambridge collapsed to 159 all out, chasing 203 to win. Wicketkeeper Sam Westaway hit a valuable 53 down the order for Oxford before teammate Owen Jones took four for 27 from his 6.2 overs to complete a fantastic victory. In the Davidstowe National Village Cup final, there was a triumphant goodbye as Woodhouse Grange signed off with victory over Foxton Cricket Club. The North Yorkshire side made the most of their final Lord's appearance as next year they'll be ineligible for the tournament. They set Foxton an imposing 257 from their 40 overs with 50s from brothers Chris Bilton and Andrew Bilton along with captain Nick Hadfield. The Cambridge side fought valiantly and despite an impressive 74 from Kai Sanderson were 19 runs short as they finished on 237 for eight. It was another up and down year for Middlesex at Lords as the county shone in four day cricket but once again struggled for consistency in the shorter formats. T20 campaign was disappointing. Um, expected a lot more, having invested a lot of time and effort uh, during the winter to try and improve the skills of the players. Uh, some excellent performances. We beat Kent here, in a, which was one of the best 2020 performances I've seen us produce. Uh, and again, we beat uh, Surrey here, which is always nice in front of a full house. So, yeah, we look forward to playing 2020 games here. They're, they're wonderful evenings, uh, especially when the sun comes out and you get a big crowd in. Uh, but it's an area we need to improve going into 2016. In the county championship, we were a good team. Our record at Lords over recent times has been outstanding. We want to make Lords, it's certainly a place where we enjoy playing, where we've got a very good uh, success rate, uh, and we want that to continue. 2016, we want to improve. Um, finishing second was good, uh, put up the best challenge for Yorkshire, but we want to get above them and you can't rely on them coming backwards. We've got to make sure that our players do perform better and I think there's the, the scope to do that. Yeah, our Royal London campaign, there were some encouraging signs in, in the 50 over competition, especially the game here against Glamorgan where, as I say, Milan got a brilliant 100, uh, Sterling got some runs. Uh, Nick Gubbins played very well in that competition too uh, and we're very sort of hopeful that he's going to continue to develop and, and be a player that's going to provide entertainment for everybody here at Lords in the years to come. Nurturing and developing talent is a key role for MCC and this was no different in 2015. The club's young cricketers program and university scheme continue to produce first class and international cricketers. I was at Cardiff for four years, uh, studied uh, biomedical science and yeah, brilliant to be part of the MCCU scheme. Definitely sort of developed me off the field but also as a cricketer it gave me the chance just to really train while studying and um, develop me a lot, yeah. I think the university scheme helps players both on and off the field. I think it's really important that players go to university um, obviously to get a good qualification behind them but the likes of Mark Patini who, who've gone through the, the, the scheme here at Cardiff will have benefited from the sports science and medicine input that they'd, they'd have had from their scheme. They've, they'll be fitter players, they'll have spent a lot of time with coaches in really good facilities and their cricket will not have regressed by the time the, come, the summer comes around. They'll have developed over the, over the winter months to play some first class cricket and that can only be good for their cricket development. In the MCCU University Challenge final, Billy Root stole the show. The younger brother of England batsman Joe smashed a phenomenal 69 ball 135 to help Leeds Bradford defeat Cardiff by 117 runs. It was a good year for the Root family as Billy also made his county debut for Nottinghamshire. In the women's final, Loughborough once again dominated proceedings. They faced Exeter on the nursery ground, looking to win their fifth title in five years. England's Anya Shrubsole helped reduce Exeter to 11 for two before they recovered to 186 for seven from their 50 overs. In reply, Loughborough got off to a good start. Half centuries from England duo Natalie Skyver and Georgia Elwes secured victory with 22 overs to spare. The MCC Young Cricketers saw the end of an era this summer when Mark Elaine stepped down as MCC head coach after nearly seven years in charge. The former England all-rounder helped develop many young players in his time at the club. 
then it was good news for Adam Hose, who graduated from the scheme last summer, as he was awarded a 14-month contract at Somerset. The MCC Schools versus England Schools Cricket Association match saw a thrilling victory for MCC. Bradley Lynch top scored for MCC with 68 as they chased down Eskers 219, but not before a stutter which saw Tyler Meyer hold his nerve at the death to hit the winning runs with one ball to spare as MCC scampered across the line eight wickets down. It was the first time since 2011 that MCC had won this fixture. The CMJ Spirit of Cricket Awards, named in memory of former MCC President Christopher Martin Jenkins, honoured those who have best exhibited the spirit of cricket. New Zealand captain Brenda McCullum won the professional award for the manner in which he and his side conducted themselves throughout the 2015 summer. Yeah, look, we've, I think our team, we've, we've changed our philosophy slightly. We, we give everything we possibly can to represent our country and um, we're now finally playing like New Zealanders as a group. Um, but at the same time, when the game's done, the game's done. So what a great opportunity to be able to respectfully just sit, sit around and share a beer or coke, whatever it is, with your opposition. And I believe in that philosophy and that's why I play the game. That respect for your opposition and your teammates. In the Boys Award, under 15, Oliver Stewart, a wicketkeeper who plays for Burn CC in North Yorkshire, called back a batsman who was adjudged to have been caught behind. The batsman went on to help his team win a close encounter. It was quite a crucial point in the game and they had one fairly strong batsman left and I delivered the ball to him and um, everyone thought it was an inside edge and it was it was got out and the umpire gave him out. Mm -hmm. But I noticed with it being quite a full ball, the ball had just bounced after leaving his bat so I, I couldn't feel as though a batsman could be out when he isn't out and I could take credit for something I didn't feel I deserved. In the girls category, Ballinger Wagoners under-13s were worthy winners for their display of sportsmanship during a game against Chesham girls. In a tennis side match, Ballinger lent Chesham four players when they were fielding, as they only had six of their own. And when Chesham were batting, allowed two pairs to bat for eight overs and the other pair for the remaining four to complete their 20 overs. This display of the spirit of cricket would become even more impressive when Chesham went on to win the league and Ballinger missed out on promotion in third place. And in the school award, King Solomon Academy, just down the road in Marylebone, won the grant by demonstrating how cricket helps develop their pupils. They're a school in one of the poorest wards in London, with kids from underprivileged backgrounds, and recently played their first under-13s mixed cricket match, which they won. The MCC Spirit of Cricket Cowdery Lecture this year had an Aussie flavour to it as national selector Rod Marsh reminisced about the old times and called for a change in the laws to keep the game healthy. I can't see why we ever went to the front foot law and just quietly I can reveal there are a few umpires out there at the moment who are beginning to wish we'd revert to the back foot law. It's only a matter of time before an umpire in an international or first class match is seriously hurt if not killed. And afterwards there was a Q&A session with Alistair Cook and Mahela Jawardner. But when we left Cardiff, I knew we could win the Ashes because I know we'd just beaten them, but we could put Australia under pressure in our conditions. And I thought everyone else looked at each other at the end of that game. We had obviously a few drinks in the dressing room at Cardiff. And that was the most important message I could get across to the guys that we can now win this. Because we've proven we can do it once. You can do it once, you can do it three times. They clearly ignored everything I said and we got hammered here at Lord's uh, <laughs> three days later, but um, you know, at, the end of the, at the end of the summer, obviously, you know, we'll prove that. Promoting the spirit of cricket is one of the most important things MCC does, and it encompasses a wide range of activities. In June, 600 schoolchildren from around the country joined Simon Jones and Charlotte Edwards for the MCC Chance to Shine Spirit of Cricket Open Day. Children took over Lord's for the day, and they heard the spirit of cricket message. We want to get as many children as we can play in the game. You know, you've got to have respect for your teammates uh, and the opposition. Um, and hopefully, you know, these children come here today and, and go away with a smile on their face, but having had some fun as well. MCC were busy all over the world with tours to Suriname and Panama, Denmark and Menorca. But perhaps the tour that 2015 will be best remembered for is one of the most important overseas trips in the club's recent history, a two-week trip to Nepal. 
MCC delivered coaching clinics to local children and played a variety of fixtures against Nepal, helping further develop one of the strongest ICC associate nations in such a tough year for the country that suffered devastating earthquakes in April and May. I think you just look around um, at all the kids that all got smiles on their faces and running around just enjoying themselves and enjoying life. Um, and I think that's what, what it's all about and if we can help contribute to that, um, which I think we are having them here, um, they're so polite just coming up this morning to, as we rocked up to the, the training session, all came, came over and, and shook our hands um, and just such happy, happy kids and I think getting them out here, playing in the fresh air um, and enjoying, enjoying what they love to do. <laughs> Back at home, the club continued to go from strength to strength with the amount of MCC cricket played. On Wednesday, the 24th of June, the club had its busiest day of the year as there were 21 MCC matches taking place across the country, stretching from the north of Scotland down to the south coast. It's really amazing that the MCC office is able to cope with organising all those matches all at once. Um, you know, so hats off to, off to them uh, and um, wonderful to think of um, you know, all the people who are getting the enjoyment out of playing for, the, playing for and representing the MCC and helping to develop cricket around the country. The fact that the MCC can have 20 matches in the day just shows quite how active the club is and how willing people are to come and play, um, come miles from miles around to play for the MCC and it shows the health that the club's in and everyone's very keen to represent it. 2015 was a summer of cricket that will live long in the memory at Lords, with so much enjoyment at the home of the game. Described frequently as the home of cricket, I read something just the other day and he referred to Lords as the heartbeat of the world game. And that's something that uh, we need to be ever mindful of. People do look to Lords uh, as the headquarters of world cricket and I believe the future for Lords is secure. And so now to 2016, a year which holds much intrigue. Building work will see a new Warner stand take shape. The return of Pakistan to these shores for the first time since 2010 will be sure to create stories and to make headlines. Sri Lanka will be back, but this time without the stalwarts Kuma Sangakkara and Mahela Jaiwardena. Last time Sri Lanka were here, they managed to pull off a memorable victory on English soil with a 1-0 win that included a rearguard action at Lords. And for Pakistan, well, they'll want to right the wrongs of 2010. It's sure to be a fascinating summer. For more great videos from Lords, please subscribe.